Heavenly Father, how we praise you and thank you for the wonderful gift of this day, of this time, this opportunity to look into your word, to look at the end, to look at what you are going to do on this planet. You didn't owe us this revelation, and yet you gave it to us. And Father, as we see things uh, lining up and we see it making sense, it gives us confidence and courage in the rest of our uh, knowledge and understanding of your word, uh, of your character. It enables us to uh, rightly understand where we're at and how we're meant to act and live. So, Father, please give us wisdom in this time. Might we listen to your word, and might we glorify you by the application throughout our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. So everybody, every year, millions of people around the world tune in to the Super Bowl. Now, this is hilarious because, by and large, much of the rest of the world rolls their eyes at American football. And then, sure enough, on Super Bowl Sunday, they're all sneaking over to the TV like, Oh, hold the cricket match. I'll just get off. And No, no, I'm not watching the Super Bowl. It's just, they're all watching, right? Everybody watches. It's an amazing worldwide spectacle. And even people like myself who don't even know who's playing are going to be there and interested to see what happens. And then tomorrow, we're all going to talk about what happens, who won, what were, the, uh, uh, what were the ads that we liked or disliked, and so on and so forth. And the reason why it's such a spectacle is that it is the point of the entire season. If this entire football season just ended with everybody and they just tallied up all the games and said whoever won the most games wins, we probably would be less interested not only in that final event of the season, but we'd be less interested in football in general. We know it has to come to a final confrontation. It has to come to a point. It has to come to, the, uh, to, to this climax for it to be interesting, for it to be worthwhile, for, for it to find out who is the best team this year, or at least who wins this year, if that's uh, not always the same thing. But today, before we see the oblong carry ball climax, because calling it football is a little goofy, but let's call it oblong carry ball, because that's way more accurate to what we're doing. Before we get to that climax, let's look at another climax, the climax of planet Earth, the very peak, the high moment in the story. And I think this is it. I mean, when we look at the shape of a story, whatever kind of novel or book that is, we will often look for a rising action and intensity, maybe some ups and downs, but there's going to be one moment where victory is achieved, and then you get the, and then they lived happily ever after. And you just leave that story assuming that everything else went uh, pretty much to plan, and that's precisely what this moment is, this moment of the return of Christ. So, as you know, we've been going over this uh, tribulation period according to Jesus Christ in Matthew 24, and we'll see this goes on into Matthew 25. It is often called the Olivet Discourse, and if you've been joining us in the morning class, you're also getting double exposure and hopefully that reinforcement and repetition that's necessary to put this stuff away. And if there's anything that I can in encourage you to believe in this time, other than that Jesus Christ died for your sins and that you can be saved by faith in him, it's that eschatology or the end times is not some esoteric doctrine for the most advanced pastors, Christians, and scholars. Every single believer is meant to know what the Lord has ahead for us, not so that we can fight over it or argue over it or, argue over it or try to prove that we're right or anything to that uh, effect, but so that we can know and understand what God's purposes are and how He means to be glorified in this earth. It's quite interesting that one of the most eschatological books or one of the books that has the most end times information in the New Testament is First and Second Thessalonians, both written to an almost infant church that had received almost no instruction because Paul was kicked out of Thessalonica very early on. He got to spend very little time there, and so his correspondence was less. And one of the things he wanted them to know beyond a shadow of a doubt was what was going to happen in the end. And why? 
Well, because bad ideas about the end had caused bad living in their lives. So 1 Thessalonians is written to encourage some lazy brothers and sisters who had said, well, Jesus is coming back anytime. We don't have to work. We don't need to do anything. Let's just chill out, put our feet up, and wait for the Lord to come. And Paul reminds them that is not the case. Others were saddened because they thought the people were dying, who were dying, must have missed it, must be judged by God, and they're going to somehow miss out on the uh, return of Christ in the millennial kingdom. Other people were being convinced that they were already in the tribulation and that they were already involved in the end, that they'd missed the rapture or something to that kind, and that had brought them great trouble, sorrow, and despair. Paul clears all these things up because what you believe about the end actually matters. It matters a great deal. So we started with this overview of the tribulation period, according to Jesus, from 4 to 14. And we saw that that was, again, Jesus giving the big picture, just like we did in this morning's class. You get the big picture, and then you detail out or draw out the important details for the discussion. In this case, uh, that was Jesus zooming in on the second half of the tribulation, which we looked at last week, and we stopped just shy of the return of Christ. And that was quite a blessing indeed, one, because you got to go home a half an hour earlier than you would have had I gone into the return of Christ, but perhaps even more so because the return of Christ as the ultimate fixed hope for all the world. It is that moment when Christ returns and takes his place that we will see the stain and the difficulty and the trials of sin begin to be unwound and undone. It is there that we will see his redemptive work playing itself out in the most literal, actual, and physical means possible. It deserves a uh, a few minutes of our time without any uh, distraction. So this uh, passage that we're going to look at today through, in verses 29 through 44 comes in three exciting sections. The first one is uh, 29 through 31, which focuses on the second coming of Christ, or what we now know as the second coming of Christ. The Matthew 24, 32 through 35 has the illustration of the fig tree. And 24, 36 through 44 uh, talks about the day and the hour, which will be of great importance uh, in our discussion. Because ultimately, if there's one thing that can help you spot a phony, spot a fake, spot a deceiver, it's the person who's trying to date or tell you when these things are going to happen. And it's difficult. Because as we see the pins lining up, as we hear the rustling behind the curtain, if you like, of the big show that's about to start, it's easy to get overexcited because we're small and we're dumb and we're easily confused. And so people say things, even good, reputable Bible churches, like, I'm pretty sure I'm going to live to see it, which is a stupid thing to say because you just don't know. You might. It certainly could. We're definitely meant to believe that it could happen at any moment. But also, we're given no guarantee that even though it is more clear how these events are likely to take place than ever before, it doesn't mean that we're necessarily the rapture generation. But we're meant to carry around that hope within us. So again, it's very important that we, uh, we heed the words of Scripture in saying that anybody trying to lay out or delineate days or times or seasons or years is an error, and you should probably mark and avoid that person, even if it's really just born out of, a, we might call it an overbearing optimism in the hope that we get to be that uh, rapture generation. Because we all do, right? I was talking to a, a beloved saint in our body, I think last night at the games night, about how, uh, um, you know, it's one thing to say you're not afraid to die, but we're not super excited about the process, right? Like, there's just not a lot of totally... Un, or totally comfortable ways out of this life. And this is uh, something to think about, right? So it's attempting to us just to be a part of the rapture generation to not have to ride that ride. I'd take it, right? And I imagine you would too. Uh, but there's other reasons, in fact, better reasons to anticipate the rapture, and that is seeing Christ face to face. Nevertheless, we uh, move into uh, verses 29 through 31 of chapter 24 of the book of Matthew. It starts immediately after the tribulation of those days. The sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power 
and great glory. And he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together and his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. So again, we have that immediately, and it's uh, something to think about how immediately. We just, uh, we can't say is, is immediately that in that exact second, is that days, weeks, or months? Is he talking more seasonally? And it seems again that he's speaking more generally as opposed to giving them uh, specific time markers. Why? Because he's going to, he one, gave them time markers in Daniel and Zechariah. He's going to give them even more specific time markers when he reveals the book of Revelation to John. Uh, but we see here that he's giving them sort of that big picture of the second half and what precedes the coming of Christ. So we see the darkening of the sun and the moon is a feature of the final days of the tribulation. We saw this uh, last week in Revelation 16, 10, and 11. It says, the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and the kingdom became full of darkness, and they gnawed their tongues because of the pain. They blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, and did not repent of their deeds. I need not remind you that light is the sole possession of God Almighty. It was he that created the heavens and earth, and it was he that declared, let there be light. Furthermore, it was he who appeared uh, and, and, and prophesied the appearing of Christ, arise, shine, for your light has come. And finally, Christ, who calls, is the light of life. This picture of light is both a physical picture as well as a spiritual picture, because just as we need light to see things, so we need God's revelation, God's light, specifically through the person of Jesus Christ, in order to spiritually perceive anything. And now, at this point, later into the second half of the tribulation, we see that God removes physical light to symbol, uh, symbolically, but also literally, show them what was going on spiritually. As that darkness uh, clouds everything, and we have no sense that it lifts at any point, that, the, that some large portion of the latter half of the tribulation, or latter part of the tribulation, is conducted in absolute darkness. You need a flashlight when you wake up in the middle of the night, and a flashlight when you wake up in the middle of the day. It's like Alaska all the time. I don't know how Alaskans do that. I think it's really impressive. But I think the days of light actually may be more difficult because, you know, figuring out when to sleep would be hard. But, but regardless, you've got this kind of situation where you've got an extended period of, of darkness that throws off all of our rhythms that are meant to, our sleep rhythms and all those other things that are meant to, to work. I mean, and then you think about the massive devastation that will have come upon the earth and easy ways of like just flipping on electric lights may not be available for many, if any. And so all of a sudden, things like oil and lamps and things to burn, candles to burn, will become pretty high commodities, you can imagine. But they respond, we see, with this blaspheming of God. So other ast astrological phenomena have existed throughout the tribulation or will exist throughout the tribulation, but the return of Christ will be the most phenomenal event of all history. And we can imagine with uh, some trepidation, what it would be like to live in this horror and this darkness as the world scrambles to try to draw together this rebellion against the coming Christ in cloak of darkness and to see that light coming, to see that light tearing through the spiritually given darkness that so mirrors the darkness that fell upon Egypt during the ten plagues of the Exodus. And then we are told that there's going to be a sign of the Son of Man coming uh, in heaven, or Son of Jesus, or Jesus Christ coming in heaven. Now, there are those who argue that there will be some sort of sign or symbol, like uh, when, when Constantine, at least uh, theoretically, when Constantine was uh, in the middle of a losing battle, he saw a sign of the cross in the sky, allegedly. And that sign of the cross, he heard a voice saying, in this, you, will con you shall conquer. And that's when he purportedly became a believer and started to legalize Christianity in the West and in the Empire of Rome. Uh, so other, many have thought it'd be a sign like that, some sort of glowing, floating, or flying uh, sign in heaven that cannot be mistaken. However, I think the simplest explanation is also the best, and that is we don't know from what length, distance, that, we, that Jesus Christ and you and I will be approaching this planet. But we know that we'll come with the light of the world. 
So again, imagine the fear and trepidation for those worldlings who have, accept, who have rejected God again and again, who've blasphemed his name again and again as we see this, this huge seeming satellite or star or something come from afar and finally break through the atmosphere of planet Earth and come closer and closer and wonder where it will finally touch down to come as it, as it approaches to become more cognizant that that's not a comet, that's not a fireball, that is, that's a person. It's a whole bunch of people. It's a, it's a massive crowd. And who knows how well the, they'll be able to see, but I, I very much suspect that people will run and grab binoculars and telescopes and get the most amazing images of the coming Messiah. And it's uh, not for us to dwell upon those who have rejected God, who will do that only with fear and terror, but imagine those faithful believers, those who endured persecution, the martyrdom of their friends, loss, pain, and sorrow in the highest degree, finally seeing their hope arriving from afar. In describing this event, Revelation 19 says, Now I saw heaven opened. Imagine that. Heaven opened. We could think that that was a prehistoric sort of, uh, you know, primitive view, the idea that heaven has a door and it opens, but I believe that that could easily be the, the, Jesus Christ breaking through the atmosphere of our world, and it looks like something opening. Anytime we send something or rather bring something back from space, we always have to worry about the angle that it comes back or it's going to burn up on reentry. Isn't that what they tell us? Well, Jesus Christ will not burn up on reentry, but rather all that would burn up anything that enters our atmosphere will be parted perfectly for his and our entrance. He says, and he who sat on him was called faithful and true. In righteousness, he judges and makes war. His eyes like a flame of fire and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood and his name is called the word of God. And the armies in heaven clothed in fine linen white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations. And he gathers himself, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of of lords. I hope that you couldn't help but visualize the power and the grandeur of this amazing event to which we look forward. But we don't look forward, as we said, to seeing it from the perspective or vantage point of the earth. We look forward to seeing this world come closer. Have you ever uh, been on a plane? There's some fun to being able to look out the window while the earth comes closer and closer and closer. And finally, the pilot, you know, skillfully, hopefully, touches down. And you can start to see the, uh, the, even the very small, you know, details of the ground around you. Can you imagine rolling over the earth, across the skies, as things get more clear. Looking down and leaning over to a friend and saying, I think that's where Colorado was. <laughs> Looks crispy. As it comes closer and closer and seeing the enemy's army bandied together after what they thought was one great victory and before what becomes their greatest defeat. We see that this Jesus Christ is one with robe dipped in blood. That robe dipped in blood points us to Jesus Christ's sacrifice as the Savior. You see, it is because Jesus Christ died for sins that we can be made qualified to ride behind him as the church. And it is because Jesus Christ died for sins that there will be a faithful remnant both from Israel as well as from the Gentiles who will be in existence, who will have survived and been supernaturally preserved in order to people the world during the millennial 
kingdom so that there will be truly the nations, the ethnos, and the Jews represented in that millennial kingdom, in that redeemed world. And all because Jesus Christ came in his first coming and gave his life on the cross for you and for I. That was all that qualified us to ride with him instead of receiving his wrath along with everyone else. And the armies of heaven, that's us, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Isn't that amazing? He will put us on horses like his. We will be clothed in fine white linen because we have been cleansed by his work. I also think it's interesting that there is no mention of armor upon us. It could be that our new bodies are impervious to any kind of pain or or loss, but I think and very much suspect that we're not there to fight on that day, but to spectate he who will destroy the armies of the Antichrist with the word of his mouth. And therefore, we can wear our pretty white clothing, knowing that nothing is going to get sullied or ruined or stained. Now, out of his mouth goes this white, uh, this sharp sword. I believe that there is this uh, Hebrew symbolism is being used here. And what is he going to do but speak for the word of his mouth? And the forces of evil will be undone. Showing, as was so well pointed out in this morning's class, that this will not be a difficult thing at all for God to see his will done. After that, we see in accordance with Psalm 2 that the Messiah, Jesus Christ, rules with a rod of iron and that he himself treads the winepress of the fierceness of wrath of Almighty God. We see that he becomes the final word on everything on planet Earth. At that point, we will have the ruler that we have needed and will wonder, or may wonder from today's perspective, why wait so long? Why allow us to bump around in the dark and cause so much confusion and so much difficulty? Why allow us to struggle through this time? Why not just come back now and fix it all instantly? But the truth of the matter is, is that God is doing more with this world than making us happy. He's making it clear that under any circumstances and any time, two things are plain. One, we need the God who who created us, who loves us, who redeems us. And two, no matter what He provides, our sinful nature will rebel against Him. And so, after this thousand years, reading ahead in the story of Christ's reign, Satan is still able to pull a great multitude to himself even from a generations of generation upon generation of people that have never known death, pain, famine, sickness, sorrow, suffering, war, bloodshed. Even then, there will be those who can be deceived. And so I encourage you to be vigilant, Christian. You can't lose your salvation. It is won by Christ. As we sang this morning, great is thy faithfulness. The story of salvation is not the story of the faithfulness of certain people. It is the story of the faithfulness of Almighty God who loved us and gave himself up for us. Once you have entered into that relationship with him, that love, as the hymn tells us, will not let you go. That's great news. But you can be deceived. You can. I can. We all can. And the only hope to avoid that deception is to keep our eyes fixed on He who is the way, the truth, and the life. There's no chance outside of looking to His light with every moment. And the minute your eyes are off Him, you are already prone to, if not entirely, deceived. This picture of the return of Christ is not unique to Revelation. In fact, it's quite interesting that uh, many of the pseudepigraphic documents or those documents that were written by other people, other Jewish people, particularly between the Testaments, uh, include similar descriptions of this final event, as well as other eschatological events. And some have said, see, Revelation just ripped them off. But that's false. Because the truth of the matter is those documents, just like um, others, uh, yeah, those documents in specific, were operating from exactly the same information that God had given everyone in the Old Testament. So their guesses weren't guesses, but more so, you know, kind of left-behind style fictionalizations of what they hoped to see. 
I'm not suggesting that any of those documents are inspired, nor am I suggesting that they're entirely wrong. Just pointing out that when people make that kind of attack on the reliability of the Bible, we say, well, of course. Of course those Jewish uh, scholars and um, faithful throughout time could see what was in the Old Testament and make similar conclusions that were actually turned out to be absolutely accurate because of what we saw in Revelation. So here's Zechariah 14, 1 through 4. It says, Behold, the day of the Lord is coming, and your spoil will be divided in your midst. For I will gather all the nations to battle against Jerusalem. The city will be taken, the houses rifled, and the women ravished. Half of the city shall go into captivity, but the remnant, the people, shall not be cut off from the city. Then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations as He fights in the day of battle. And in that day His feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west, making a very large valley. Half of the mountain shall move toward the north and half of it towards the south. Note here the very important statement, the Lord, that is in those capital letters, right? That is Yahweh, that is the name of Jehovah God. He's going to go forth and personally fight. And we might be tempted to think that this is some sort of anthropomorphism, and it would have been easy to think so from the Jewish perspective, but what do we have in this final verse here, of this, these verses? That His feet, the Lord, the Messiah, has literal feet with ten toes that will stand, that will touch down and cause a massive change in the very topography of earth. That revelation, as you see, is Zechariah written uh, hundreds of years before even the ministry, the earthly ministry of Christ. This is an important theme. And it comes with another important theme, which is the regathering of Israel. Now, this is not a, a, a new theme at all. Again, this is Jesus Christ reaffirming uh, the prophecies that had been put forth. Deuteronomy 30 and verse 4 constitutes part of what we call the Palestinian covenant, which is sometimes separated from the Mosaic covenant. The reason why we separate that at times is because the Mosaic covenant was largely conditional. In fact, it's the only major theological covenant that's not or that is conditional, that's not unconditional. And so, uh, if they obey and they, are, they do well and they keep God's law, they're blessed in every sense and every uh, area of life. And if they reject God's law and rebel against God's commandments, then they receive difficulty, hardship, judgment, and discipline from God. But God reminds them in what's sometimes regarded as a secondary Palestinian covenant, uh, when you're unfaithful, I will discipline you and I will bring you back. And so he says in Deuteronomy 34, if any of you are driven out to the farthest parts of heaven from there, the Lord your God will gather you and from there he will bring you. And so this idea of a regathering, of a scattering and regathering is a part of Israel's hope and has been since the very beginning. Isaiah 11, 11 and 12, gives similar message. It shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set His hand against the second time to recover the remnant of His people who are left from Assyria and Egypt, from Pathros and Cush, from Elam and Shinar, from Hamath and the islands of the sea. He will set up a banner for those nations and will assemble the outcasts of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. Now, I can't begin to list all of the uh, references to the regathering of Israel, but suffice it to say that it is the legitimate hope of Israel and it will be an event of the latter end or the latter days of the uh, tribulation period. Upon Christ's return, there will be another rapture whereby I, how I see it playing out, another rapture whereby the living children of Israel, the living Jews at that time who've remained faithful will be drawn unto him. Precisely when, precisely how, what it'll look like in the finer chronology, I can't be overly dogmatic. But the hope of Israel is the hope of the world. And that is the Son of God, Jesus Christ, as He comes to earth. And we want to point out, yet again, you don't see hordes of Hittites roaming the earth today. Edomites, Hivites, all the ites are pretty much gone or melded into other groups. But you still see Israelites. 
God has preserved the people of Israel. He has preserved the nation of Israel. And make no mistake, he is on the move. He is working to make sure that everything will be in line at whatever time that he chooses to pull the trigger and begin or recommence his eschatological plan. That is a reason the existence of Israel, in spite of the world making regular attempts to remove her from this planet, is a reason to trust in the Bible, to trust in the God of the Bible, and to trust in the promises which God made you as well when you trusted in Christ. So we move on to the topic of the fig tree. It says, now learn this parable from the fig tree. When its branches has already become tender and put forth leaves, you know that summer is near. So you also, when you see all these things, know that it is at the door, at the doors. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. So now we get lessons from a fig tree, which is interesting all by itself. Uh, uh, when, we, when we look at this fig tree, we want to make sure that we recognize that there is a reality uh, of, of, of over-connecting things in Scripture, right? We did see another fig tree. We saw a fig tree in Matthew 21, 18 through 19, right? Jesus cursed a fig tree, and we saw how that was symbolic, not of Israel as a whole, but symbolic of the g- leadership of that generation. And God essentially, or Jesus essentially, is telling them that they will not be recipients of the kingdom as they might have been had they accepted him. And so we don't want to draw false lines and try to find this fig tree in that fig tree. That doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense in terms of the narrative. And it's uh, drawing unnecessarily, unnecessary parallels that really only cause complication for the text. He's just pointing out, look at a fig tree. Look at the natural order of things. And he's saying, you guys understand how the seasons change. You look out and you see the, uh, you know, the, the weather change and the leaves change color. They fall. You wait the time when things are going to bring forth fruit and you prepare for that so that you can bring in and preserve that fruit to provide for your ourselves for uh, the months uh, to come. He's just pointing out, you already know that this happens, so recognize, as he speaks to the generation to come, just recognize when you see these happening that the end is ultimately near. Why will you need to do that? Well, you got to remember, in the Bible, when we read the book of Revelation, we get to read those high point events We see what's important. We see what God's doing. And with some exceptions, we mostly see God's actions in the affair. Sometimes we will see uh, the response on earth, and it's generally not positive. In fact, it is never positive. And yet, we want to point out that there will be politicians spinning everything. There will be people who are saying, oh, come on, everyone's just overreacting. It's just a tough time. We're going to get through it, and everything's going to be fine. There will be plenty of people who don't expect it to last seven years. In fact, don't expect it to last another year. And one catastrophe after another, well, we see that people become increasingly aware that this is the judgment of God. There will also be people who are spinning this for the purposes of trying to assuage everybody and basically keep everybody uh, at work because of their anti-God viewpoint. They will deceive themselves into almost anything to come about or to bring about an explanation or alternate explanation of what's going on. And so Christ reminds this generation who experience these things not to lose heart and not to accept the world's explanation for this. He says that what things will not, or this generation will not pass away. Now, this is problematic. You have about three good choices as to what to do with this generation. There are those who say that this generation, Jesus is using the near demonstrative pronoun, this, as opposed to that, the far generation, or far demonstrative pronoun. He's using that near demonstrative pronoun. So they say it must be the group that Jesus is talking to right there. He's actually talking to the disciples. And so therefore, he is telling them that whatever that 20, 30, 40 year window, and interestingly, there's no really biblically solid way or surefire way to, to call what a generation is. And actually, it's been quite funny because essentially the people who are interested in prophecy have looked at the, uh, the, the establishment of Israel and said, well, that started the clock. It 
didn't start the clock. That started the clock, and then we're just waiting for one generation. So that's 10 years, or that's 20 years. Oh my, that's 30 years. Oh wait, that's 40 years. It's 50 years. We just keep playing this ridiculous game because we don't understand the nature of the, the prophecies that are being put, and we're just so excited to put time stamps and time stickers on things. So the, the first way to deal with this is to call it Jesus' generation, or rather that generation that was born sometime in that time, and generally speaking, they'll end it out with 70 AD, and read through all the judgments of Revelation, as well as what Jesus is saying here, finding in, interesting little peccadillos or things from history that happen in that time period, and try to say, well, that's kind of like locusts. At, you know, Vesuvius goes off, or Pompeii, or, you know, so on and so forth. They, they try to find these small examples of what might barely uh, fit or, or satisfy these prophecies. But always it falls woefully short, because ev as we see so clearly both in Christ's teaching as well as in the book of Revelation, these are worldwide catastrophes, not little localized events. This is a major worldwide uh, drama that's going on uh, between heaven and earth. And to downplay that seems a little bit forced and, and terribly stretched. The next possibility is that this generation refers to the Jewish people, that the succeeding generations of the Jewish people will not be wiped away. That works for sure, but that really uh, is, is, is so generic it kind of would always work. So it, it's a comfortable answer, and it certainly is not at odds with the text, but at the same time, it doesn't really account for the timing issues that seem to be put into play here. And so I think that the third option is the most reasonable, and that is when he says this generation, he is talking about that generation which enters into the tribulation period. So in other words, he's giving them assurance that this tribulation is not going to kill everybody. See, that's important, because if you take the first view, then he's making some sort of a, a timing statement. But if you take the third view, or even the second view, he's making another statement saying that ultimately, this tribulation, horrible though it is, is not going to eradicate all of human life, which he's affirmed in the past. So this makes a great deal of sense. That generation, that group of people that may be on the earth today will not be destroyed entirely, but will be witness of Christ's coming to the earth. And for every time that you've been comforted and encouraged by the doctrine, the belief, the understanding of the rapture that Jesus Christ is coming to snatch you away, multiply that by 10,000 and know the joy and comfort that will be every time a tribulation era saint thinks on the coming of Jesus Christ and his promise that while that person individually might be destroyed, this generation will surely not be destroyed. And then he ends with a statement that is quite remarkable. He says, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. Now, of course, this uh, harmonizes beautifully with 2 Peter 3.10 and Revelation 2.11. But what I want to point out, or 2 Peter 3.10 and Revelation 2.11, by the way, are talking about the destruction of planet Earth. That everything you see at this point, as we've studied through our little mini-series on the tribulation here, is that everything will be largely destroyed, incinerated, shaken up, crunched up, chewed up, and spit out. It's going to be a remarkable change, but uh, not even, or sorry, with, with even greater judgment in mind, we see Revelation 20, verse 11, talking about the end of the millennial kingdom. Well, it's really not the end, but the transition into the new heavens and the earth. And John just says that the earth is, or the, new, or the old earth just flees away. Everything here, all of this matter, all this material is just going to flee away. But not you. God has made you of the stuff of eternity. He's made you a new creature, prepared to live in this new creation, in the new heavens and in the new earth. Think on it for a minute. You are a part of the future of God's glorious plan, walking through this world, trying to share the light of His love with others. But what I want to, want to draw your attention to most seriously here is that Jesus Christ is absolutely making a statement of deity here. 
when he says that heaven and earth will pass away, he's absolutely right. That is true uh, and, and, and had already been revealed. But ultimately, we see that his word, claiming that his words will by no means pass away is claiming that his word is the very word of God. So Psalm 119, 89 applies as much to his word, Jesus' spoken words, as it does to any uh, written word of the Old Testament or the New. Forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. We can count on this. It's interesting to think that that as we go into the new heavens and the new earth, we'll not be taking, it seems like, many souvenirs with us. But I wonder if we'll bring a Bible along or if we'll just know it well enough by then that those words won't pass away. It's difficult to say. So with that assurance, we continue on into the next section about the day and the hour, our final section today, starting with verse 36 through 40. So it says, but, na- but of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. As the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So also will be the coming of the Son of Man, or so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Then two men will be in the field. One will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken and the other left. Watch therefore, for you do not know at what hour your Lord is coming, but know this. That if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, you also be ready, for the Son of Man is, ex- is coming in an hour that you do not expect. Now, as we mentioned in the, the earlier section of our, our kind of preview of the Olivet Discourse, we note that this is not, I believe, the rapture, but I think we can see why. The allusion to people marrying and giving in marriage and the idea of the unexpectedness of the judgment makes it sound as much like it could be describing sometime now preceding the rapture, doesn't it? I mean, things are going well enough to say that, easily say that this is going on, and we might well ask, as, as those who see the rapture here do, uh, you know, how could that be said of the latter half of the tribulation? Well, I think we can see that even though, as we pointed out, there will be and is incredible difficulty, even sickness and, and, and pain and loss and war and everything else going on, we see that there's always a swath of society that is able to insul- insulate itself reasonably and continue to enjoy the g- finer things in life. In fact, we saw that at the Revelation chapter 2, wherein it says, do not hurt the wine and the oil. So in other words, that the upper crust of society, the ruling elites, are still living their lives very well. We kind of saw this, right, when uh, we turned on our televisions, we're, we're all locked down during COVID, and you turn it on and see that some swanky governor or some swanky boy well, had thrown this huge party, and there they were all partying away, and you thought, now, wait a minute, I'm not even allowed to go to church, but you're allowed to throw a party, or at least thought you were? Yeah, that's exactly right. That's exactly how it will be at the end of the tribulation. There will be those with enough money and power to insulate themselves very largely. They'll continue to marry and give it in marriage. In fact, as we see, the naturalist humanist perspective is, what are all these obnoxious poor people doing on my planet? And so they want to reduce the population through various terms, right? So from their perspective, the population might be a good thing. We're just, we, first we got rid of all those Christians, now we're getting rid of all the extra people, and we can just simply live on our Edenic paradise. In fact, I think it's part of Satan's plan as well. <clears throat> so I don't think it's any sub, uh, substantial issue to say that people will still be going on with life as usual, as well as they can, at the time of the coming. And no one will know the day or the hour. Now, this is interesting because we note that part of the reason why no one would know the day and hour then is that the church and the rapture were yet unknown, as well as the timing of the signing of the uh, peace treaty with Israel. So we have this reality of the unexpected, or rather the uh, undated uh, rapture, the unknown but always anticipated rapture throughout the New Testament. And yet it seems from this passage, as well as Mark 13, 4 and Luke 1240, which are all talking about the second coming of Christ, I believe, not the rapture, that, uh, that the, um, will also not be perfectly predictable. 
The disciples were told they wouldn't know, interestingly, in Acts 1-8, the times and the seasons, but now with this, they don't know the day or the hour. This generation won't know the day or the hour. They will, it seems, be cognizant of the time, of the season. They'll know roughly what year it's going to happen, but they won't be able to call it down to a day, which is interesting, that the Lord continually forbids us to look into history or into history future to look into the future and try to discern it by any means other than trusting what he has revealed to us. And he continually keeps these unknowns to himself so that we must rely upon him in all ways. Then he alludes uh, to those days of Noah. The days of Noah show how man ignored the coming judgment of God and continued to live as if things were to go on forever as they had always been. The troubles that the world will face will not stop people from living their lives, as we'd already said. And finally, in fact, for the wealthy and the powerful of the world, this will seem like a dream come true. All of a sudden, all the competition for resources is gone. They were the ones who were able to uh, centralize everything for themselves and make a comfortable go of an otherwise uncomfortable time. And while they will be discouraged by all the hardships on the world that personally will affect them, they will undoubtedly comfort themselves by their greater ability to cope with it than others. And then we have the great one, one will be taken. Now this is, uh, again, another part, or this is the part that people tend to see the rapture in, which I would argue is, is not a rapture reference. And uh, the reason, obviously we could see the similarity, the idea of two people working or two people being in bed and one, people, one person disappears and the other person stays. However, we notice that he is using as his illustration Noah and the ark, right? And we note that when Christ comes, there are going to be many who are taken in judgment. The illustration of the days of Noah shows that those who are taken are actually the ones who are washed away, right? Those are the ones who are taken. And so uh, finally we see here the problem here is that the church has not been introduced yet. So the big problem here beyond uh, all this issue of the fact that clearly those taken at this point are taken into judgment is the other side in that this would be a weird place to introduce the church, wouldn't it? He's talking about Israel. He's talking about the uh, future for Israel. It'd be weird to get all the way through to the latter half of your discussion on the end times and say, oh, I forgot. There's also going to be this rapture thing. It just doesn't fit naturally with the context, whereas it fits very naturally with the context to recognize that, uh, that when Christ comes, there will be a great judgment, and those who show up at the battle of Armageddon will be judged instantly, and those who remain, as we'll see in the weeks to come, are also judged in regard to their faith in God and their reaction or actions towards Israel. So, if it were reference, reference to the tribulation, it just doesn't fit the chronology of the passage very well. And I'd like to put forth a simple uh, graph or chart for you. Only unbelievers enter into the, uh, enter into the um, tribulation period, and only believers enter into the millennial kingdom of Christ. And so there will be a cleansing on the earth of those who took the mark of the beast, of those who sided with, God, or with the Antichrist, with, the, with Satan against God. There will be a cleansing in which they all must be brought and let out of the earth and executed or, or removed before the millennial kingdom and the cleansing of the millennial kingdom will begin. So this is a reference, I believe, not to the rapture, but this is a reference to that event, to that future time at which all of the uh, leftovers are taken care of, we might say, and ultimately the earth is totally made pristine so that this final dispensation on this heavens and this earth might be begun from a place of only believers, only saved people. So, our conclusion as we continue on uh, in our study next week is that I hope that you are very deeply encouraged by the reality of what is ahead for planet Earth. I hope that you're deeply encouraged by the hope and life that is ahead. And I hope that you're deeply encouraged to know that while the Super Bowl might be a, a big event, there's a much greater event and you're not going to miss it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, how we thank you and we praise you for this wonderful gift of your revelation, of your word, of the hope, of the truth that you've given us, that you have prepared us and built us up in order to walk with you, in order to walk in light of that revelation, 
Lord, we know that there is no plan or scheme or action or leader that is going to bring healing, health, or peace to this planet. We know that until the coming of your son, Jesus Christ. And so in him, we place our hope. In him, we place our faith. And we pray that each of us might recognize what it means to have a sure, fixed, immovable, and certain hope in life, light of all lights and certain, life's uncertainties. In the matchless name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. I invite you to